Welcome back to the news, everyone. So, it's been quite a week. We've got some interesting changes. Blizzard are going all out to promote the game, so uh, just get ready for you to get a bunch of mounts. And uh, we have a little bit of a hint at what happened when Preach flew himself to Blizzard's office with a camera. Fun time, so let's get stuck in. You know, as it stood, Dragonflight was pretty much dead on arrival. Uh, there's a situation where Wrath of the Lich King has a login dragon, but Dragonflight didn't have a login dragon, and that clearly would have killed the expansion. I mean, Shadowlands didn't have a login screen dragon, and it wasn't great. The good news is Blizzard have saved the expansion, finally fixing it, with uh, Alex Straza now being on the login screen, meaning that all is well in the world, and uh, also they posted the theme music for the expansion over on YouTube. Well, with Warcraft saved, now we've got the 12-month bundle. It's an odd bundle because it doesn't save you any money at all, compared to the six-month bundle that maybe you're already on because you wanted a mount. Now, Blizzard... Uh, I mean, obviously, look, you will save some money going onto the six month bundle, obviously only if you plan on playing all of those six months. With this 12 month bundle, Blizzard obviously does not want to decrease their revenue per user. Instead, they are increasing the perceived value of the bundle by adding zero cost replication digital goods. So it's a pretty smart way for Blizzard to lock in customers for a longer period of time at the same rate of monetization as the existing six month sub. Now, of course, offering an annual plan is very common in the software as a service world, often though it does kind of come with uh, a lower price and, uh, you know, not a big murloc, so that's what's happening here. All right, the 12-month sub will get you the Gargantuan Gurloc, Tilik the Stormhorn, the Nether Gorged Great Worm, which of course is the uh, current existing six-month mount, and the Lunar New Year 2023 mount, which probably would have been in the next six-month bundle, I guess. Uh, for WoW Classic, you'll also get the Festering Emerald Drake, Tabard of the Flame, which is the current six-month reward, and the Lunar New Year 2023 pet. That's a lot of stuff, basically. Uh, but obviously, versus the existing rolling six-month sub, the only new things that you are getting is, uh, of course, uh, Talek and the Gargantuan Gurlock and the Festering Emerald Drake. I think the other things would have been in the six-month rolling subs anyway. Oh, that was a lot of business to cover. Look, obviously locking people in like this with the 12-month subscription, that can spike revenue immediately. It can increase average revenue per user because uh, any user who will churn over that 12 months, them churning will not have an impact on that year's uh, revenue for the game. So look, obviously it makes sense from a business perspective. Now, we also, though, do have an expectation set by Blizzard of a more aggressive, like, kind of content-rich patch cycle for Dragonflight. So, it's the sort of thing, if they're going to ask for this, I'm going to ask for them to deliver the goods. It seems like that is their plan. Now, of course, I will say, that them going in pretty heavily on the six-month subscription plan with the free mounts and stuff, them doing that at the same time that the game's updates were slowing down, that was obviously a very bad feeling as a customer. So basically, as always, the best way to appease the community, funny enough, is to just release a lot of content. And remember what Ian said? They want to have more frequent patches, maybe that are a bit smaller, right? Because they just want to get content out there into the game. That is now bolstered by a significantly larger team. So as we covered in the previous video, that does mean that I think the chances of us getting more content per month on average, I think that those chances are significantly higher. And speaking of content per month, patrons, thank you. So, right, here's the deal. You already know about the uh, physical loot you get on Patreon, the early access to our videos, but I want to talk a bit about impact. So, um, all right, straight up on the community front, we've hired Molly. She is absolutely fantastic and is helping across a whole load of fronts between the game development side and uh, over here on YouTube. I'm also in the middle of uh, essentially getting a kind of, I guess, talent manager thing, but basically... Um, you know, that person would offload a whole bunch of work from me that normally I have to do, and that will mean that I'll be able to focus more on actually making content for you guys. So, patrons, the revenue that we generate via Patreon is 100% reinvestment into content. That's let us do things like, as an example, hiring Laced. Yeah, the, the YouTuber, he does incredible things uh, with, uh, with the B-roll. If you've noticed that our videos look particularly sexy, uh, he's really been helping us out with uh, the footage front. It's been awesome. So, we've been able to hire him for more days, and that has led to a massive improvement in uh, the video quality of things like our upcoming lore series, which in itself is the start of a bigger content quality push. So, basically with Dragonflight seemingly being on the up, my plan is to go bloody hard 
If you'd like along on that ride, then you can hit up the Patreon link down below. And let's get to some news. Do you want even more mounts? Well, you're gonna get more mounts, uh, this time via Twitch drops that will happen between November 15th and December 28th. The first drop is the Dragon Kite Pet, then it's the Feldrake, the third is the Perpetual Purple Firework, and uh, then there's the Supporter Streamer promotion, where gifting two subs will get you a pet, and that is available to all streamers with a connected Twitch and Battle.net account. So uh, yeah, I guess to all my Twitch streaming friends, <laughs> expect a... Uh, expect a chunky tax return this year, and I suppose also, uh, for all the rest of us, expect this to basically artificially inflate the World of Warcraft category on Twitch. Now, that's not me taking a dig at Blizzard. They're obviously incentivizing people to be watching Twitch on the Warcraft category. That boosts World of Warcraft on Twitch, that leads to news articles and drives awareness. A bit like a recent hashtag thing they've done where basically if you put in like your, your character name and a few things and you tag Warcraft on Twitter, they will auto-generate like a cool little thing about your character. That obviously has led to a lot of hashtag activity that then has led to uh, World of Warcraft trending on Twitter. Right now, I think at like 32, maybe 35,000 tweets. Again, that is all savvy social media promotion shit. This will all drive awareness during launch day. Games like Overwatch 2, Valorant, and Final Fantasy XIV have done things like this to a good degree of success before. Now, there is a bit of a minor drama. The Feldrake, obviously, is a trading card game reward. There's been eBay listings successfully for thousands of dollars on that, so, uh, oh boy, someone dropped like two or three grand in this, and then Blizzard gave it away for watching World of Warcraft on Twitch for four hours. That's really awkward, isn't it? All right, tell you what, everyone, I think this is kind of awesome. There's a new achievement found on beta that unlocks all of the cool visual effects and animations that were previously only available on the Mythic Raid and Elite PvP versions of tier sets. So, you know those cosmetic effects, like the cool glowy shit? If you get this achievement, then the cool glowy shit will be activated on all difficulty mode versions of gear, right? Like all the different color tints, you'll get the fancy bells and whistles. But, <laughs> during this achievement, you will have to do one of the following. Mythic Razageth, Keystone Hero Season 1, which is timing all at plus 20, or Elite PvP Season 1, which means closing off the season with a rating of 2400. Or, no, just getting a rating of 2400. Now, this is actually quite similar to the Shadowlands uh, seasonal achievement that let you, I think it was for Season 3, that let you upgrade all your conduits to max item level. So, uh, seemingly here as well, you, you just need to unlock this on a single character, and then it will unlock those cosmetics account-wide. Now, overall, I think this is just a brilliant addition. This is something we've wanted since the start of Shadowlands, because in the Shadowlands data mining, we actually learned that all of those cool visual effects that, like, you know, as players, we can only get on, like, the Mythic Raid version of a piece of gear, Blizzard have actually made those for every single color tint. It's just that only one of them is given to us in the game. With this achievement, the full visual effects on all color tints will be available to players. Now, that said, I think this would be even better if this would later be, uh, like, a retroactive change where you can maybe unlock all the cool visual effects for previous expansion gear sets, like Shadowlands, because we know those exist. Or, what if they added a heroic version of this that only worked up to, like, the heroic raid version, you know? It would be for doing uh, heroic Razageth, or maybe Mythic Plus 15, right? I think that would be pretty good. And I only say this because I and many other people view heroic and mythic raids as not difficulty modes, but almost as two different formats of raiding. The reason why I say that is because, I mean, here's a good example. We like raiding with close to 10 people, right? We prefer, we find it more fun. It's a more intimate social experience to us. Um, but if we wanted to, say, hop into Mythic, which, I mean, we did a lot of other changes through that anyway. I don't know what shit with you there. Um, but obviously, a fixed roster of 20 people, it's a very, very different category of of thing socially. So I think it would be kind of cool if there was a heroic version of this that uh, would let people on a more flexible basis be able to access at least some of those cool cosmetic visual effects. Because as it stands, like people in my team, we would just have to split off and do Mythic Plus if we wanted to get that cosmetic. Because we're not going to change the social structure of our group, which means that we're never going to do the Mythic Razageth. 
I mean, look, I know that this is more of a, a niche concern for teams that are like mine, but who knows? Maybe that represents uh, a team that's a bit like yours in the game. Okay, anyway, overall, I think this is a fantastic change. It definitely makes ascending the highest peak of World of Warcraft content a more rewarding experience for players. The next thing then, Legacies 2 has been published. In this, Nosdormu recounts uh, more history to Emberthal, uh, this time showing the War of the Ancients, highlighting Neltharion's corruption and his betrayal, focusing in on the Dragon Soul, an artifact of absolutely tremendous power that, uh, you know, Deathwing tricked his allies into making, and then Deathwing kind of, you know, used its tremendous power to betray them. Obviously, later on, in the Cataclysm expansion, we would go back in time, snatch the Dragon Soul, and Thrall would use that to defeat Deathwing. Pretty wild time. And also, uh, that uh, period in Cataclysm is the first time that we met, like, Marzond as a, as a boss that we could fight, so it's a cool bit of lore that they're covering today. Now, Emberthal and her Drakthir, of course, were deep in stasis during all of this, so this is basically her learning of her general's uh, treachery and demise. So I think a series like this is a really fun way to recap the lore. It kind of smooths over some of the clunk of the Cataclysm narrative, but where the intrigue is, is Nosdormu, because basically, Emberthal realizes that Nosdormu wants something from her, right? He says that there's one crucial moment that has remained hidden from him, and uh, that only she can lead him there. To which I say, what the bloody hell is it? Because we know Nosdormu sees his own death, right? Like, that's revealed to him. Now, is it that he knew he would die but couldn't see his death? Or is it that he could not see beyond his death? If it's that, then maybe if... Uh, is it the case that, like, the influence of Void is what he can't see? You know? That what... Amon Thul and co. like showed to him was the true timeline of the Titans, right? Titans, you know, they're beings of order, so obviously they will have a timeline that is like the one that they think should happen. Now, what if it's the case that uh, the old god meddling with things, that's like outside of what Naltharian can see? Because the whole conceit is, you know, the likes of, like, light and order. They're very dogmatic, they're very single-minded. Whereas, you know, Void is all like, hey, let's have a crazy tentacle orgy and look far into the future and all the different timelines and, you know, madness. Right? It's tentacles and craziness and, and Void shit. You know, Lovecraftian shit. Um, so what if it is the point, then, that th there are things that Nosdormu cannot see? Like, if he could see all of time, how did he not see Naltharian's betrayal? and a bunch of other key plot points that we know were influenced by old gods. So, overall, I think that this is some further proof that the Titans set Nosdormu up to defend their timeline, the thing that they want to happen, and they told him that that was true because it's in their self-interest. But I think the old gods are representing, you know, instability, or you could maybe say they represent potential. I mean, so many of the strengths of mortals, mortals which, you know, pretty notably defeated Algalon the Observer. Like, why are we mortal? In many cases, for the denizens of Azeroth, it's because of the curse of flesh, which comes from the old gods. And it seems like that old god stuff is the sort of thing that Norsdormu, like, he can see all of time, but he can't see his bro betraying him because the tentacle boys underneath the ground whispered to him. Obvious intrigue. So I think the point here is that by the end of this legacy series, we're definitely going to learn, or at least have some hints at some pretty spicy lore. Oh, and also, um, next week is when our lore series on the dragons kicks off. Um, well, not just the dragons, the final episode is not on a dragon. But Rathian is episode one, and uh, look, the series is a real banger. Earlier on, I talked about uh, Patreon, and you know, between Patreon and the sponsors, that means that we can... Uh, I mean, I'll be straight up with you, like, videos like this Rathian one, they literally will have cost more money to produce than we will earn uh, via YouTube, like, easily. But it's the kind of content that we really enjoy making, it's the kind that we think uh, should be out there, because it's cool. And uh, why do this if not to make cool shit, basically? So, yes, Rathian episode, it comes up next week. Um, so, yeah, look forward to that. Balance, then. A surprising balance change, one relevant to me now that I plan to potentially main a healer. And that is a sudden 40% increase in player stamina and creature damage. I'm, I know, right? Now, Blizzard explained that uh, basically right now healing feels too powerful at level 70 because of the 10 extra talent points. So that's why they're increasing damage, they're increasing health, but they're not increasing healing. Now, the thing is, you might as a healer think, oh god, I'm being nerfed. 
not really. I mean, yes, but no, okay? So when healing and damage mitigation are way too strong, Blizzard are presented with a problem because they still need to challenge healers. So how do you challenge a healer who is basically overtuned? Well, you do that by having a very spiky damage profile. Now, if you were around during Mists of Pandaria, perhaps you remember patch 5.4. We had this situation that was rather similar, where incoming raid damage was extremely powerful. It was like an extremely twitch reaction based thing. If memory serves me, part of that was because of the strength of barrier healers back then. I'm fairly sure. Um, so basically, if healing is super powerful relative to damage, then Blizzard can, uh, damage and health, then Blizzard can only challenge you by basically just reacting on fast reactions and, you know, big spikes of damage, rather than, I think, what they would prefer for healing design, which is the careful choice of resource management, which means your mana and your cooldowns, that kind of thing. So, honestly, to me, this does sound okay, and it sounds reasonable, like a normal part of game development, but, obviously, it's all going to rely on the tuning, and we just need to see what that feels like when we're playing it. Next then, as previously reported, the difficulty of M Plus Dungeons at Keystone Level 10 and above will be increasing in Dragonflight. But, along with that, Blizzard are increasing the Mythic Plus rating that you'll get. So, per Keystone Level above 10, you earn an additional 2 rating. To do a comparison, in Shadowlands Season 4, completing a dungeon exactly on time on both Fortified and Tyrannical gets you 250 rating. In Dragonflight, the very same gets you 270 rating. Now that means that while keystones above the plus 10 level may be more difficult for you to time, you won't have to push as high to get Keystone Master. Blizzard actually says that with this, they now expect similar earning rates of KSM in Dragonflight as they saw in Shadowlands, which overall makes sense. All right, a few uh, snippets from the whole Preach situation. So basically, he flew over to Irvine on uh, on his own dime. Uh, basically, was like, hey, Blizzard, I want to talk to you. And uh, they ended up giving him significantly more access than uh, would usually be expected to their office and their personnel. Now, pretty much, uh, this means he, you know, he was doing this on his own terms. He was paying his way, and Blizz said yes to that. And this basically means that we'll get proper interviews that are a bit more free from the usual PR process. I believe it's something like 15. Um, so or maybe not completely free, but a lot more free from the PR process than one would normally expect. So that is exciting. Now, these interviews are not fully out, but we do have some of Mike's impressions uh, from just him streaming after the fact. So to do a bit of a TLDR, number one, Blizzard considers Dragonflight the start of Warcraft's third era. That seems quite in line with the changes we've seen. Now, I would argue that the third era of World of Warcraft actually started with Legion and ended with Shadowlands, and the Dragonflight is the fourth era, but, ah, whatever, I get the point. Second thing then, evergreen content. Uh, evergreen is a word that is being used a lot more. Overall, I think that is good news. Then on Activision and the influence in World of Warcraft, basically, Preach's takeaway was that it is not massive, um, which does make reasonable day-to-day -day sense, uh, right? I mean, the problems with World of Warcraft, like, they're Blizzard's doing for the most part. Uh, I definitely would think that. Now, that being said, I have spoken to a number of, uh, including decently senior uh, development staff who have worked on other Blizzard titles, and that is an overall sentiment that they would deeply not agree with. Um, I think for World of Warcraft, it's a situation where WoW is the cash cow. I think, you know, Activision, they obviously, you know, no, when I say Activision, what I mean is Activision Blizzard corporate, right? They are going to want to see numbers and performance. They are probably going to strategize about ways to generate more revenue per user, as we see with the uh, business development side of World of Warcraft, right? You know, like even the stuff we talked about today with the mounts, the 12 month deal, all of that stuff. So that's where you'll see Activision's uh, sort of side to things. I mean, even uh, take recently, uh, Jay Wilson, who was the lead of Diablo 3, he was speaking of Activision's influence back in that era with the likes of Immortal already being talked about. I do know from multiple Blizzard staff that there are sorts of games that quite simply would not be greenlit by Activision Blizzard corporate because of the sorts of games that they want to make and the revenue potential that they are targeting. So I imagine that Activision Blizzard corporate is more involved in revenue targets, in long-term planning, in business development. I think what Preach is specifically talking to here is day-to-day -day development and design decisions. So basically, 
Bobby Kotick didn't put a mission table in World of Warcraft because he remembers seeing kids playing Mafia Wars on Facebook. That sort of thing, that's Blizzard failing on their own terms. Now, the good example of that is Diablo 3 Expansion 2. That was cancelled by Mike Morheim and his leadership team, even though Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls significantly fixed that game and I think would have set it up for long-term success. And in making that strategic blunder, Mike Morheim and his management team did manage to completely cede the ARPG ground to Path of Exile. That's a great example of Activision not really have anything to do with it and it being Blizzard's fault. Overall though, Activision Blizzard Corporate does have more influence uh, at Blizzard. That is a straight up fact that I know from multiple sources. However, in the ways that a lot of people think about this, it is not so, right? So a lot of people will see, oh, Facebook game, mission tables, Activision did that. That is not true. That is not true at all. Uh, Activision is not in the business of design decisions on, on a game like this. No, that stuff is for the World of Warcraft team. Um, you'll see Activision be involved in other sides of things, but not in terms of game design. What they want is a very well-designed game that does well by its customers and uh, that they can obviously then have be well monetized. Uh, but yeah, so overall, you know, they're, they're, as, as Mike said, like Activision will, uh, they, they will ask the WoW team to maybe put something on the launcher, but other than that, it's not really a thing. If you want a way that Activision, like if you want to think about it, it's like Activision, talking to Blizzard leadership, thinking about how do we drive our revenue up, which is not an evil thing, by the way. That is completely natural for a business to do. And then the Blizzard team will be like, all right, so, you know, we've been talking with corporate. What do we need to do? Well, we want to see how we can get more subs, retain more subs, earn more money, because that's what we're doing as a business. And then they will strategize how to do that. And once it's greenlit, they will do that. Uh, but the idea that Activision is making minute decisions, uh, you know, as much as we all laugh about the whole, you know, you're all rats in Bobby Kotick's maze, um, you know, that, that's more of a joke from, from Rich. Uh, it's not that Bobby Kotick is sitting there designing the loot system of World of Warcraft. That's a completely preposterous thing. Um, right? Like, uh, most Bobby's going to... The worst that, like, Bobby would do is set an over-aggressive target and, you know, maybe cover up sexual harassment at the... <laughs> oh, Bobby. Oh, Bobby. Top, top. So, look, there you go. That's obviously, you know, Mike's perspective from talking to the Blizzard people who are all very adamant that Activision is not, like, having, you know, major influence in World of Warcraft. That is the sort of thing that I would agree with, but uh, I, I do think that that is not the whole story. Uh, there are things there that are relevant for other teams. I've spoken to multiple people from multiple other Blizzard games. Uh, funny enough, I've actually spoken to less Warcraft people than non-Warcraft people. Um, so, yeah, look, that's... That's overall that. I can share my perspective, and I actually don't think that it conflicts with uh, Mike and the WoW team's perspective um, either. At the end of the day, World of Warcraft is the thing that is bringing in the big, big, big money. Uh, that does mean that if there is any team within Blizzard that is going to have a little bit more clout, it's going to be them, because they are bringing in the money. And hey, at the very least, Activision Blizzard Corporate has... Uh, Give them the thumbs up to quite significantly expanding the World of Warcraft team, as we recently covered in a video. Okay, story then. So, the team wants expansions to be less narratively self-contained. Uh, you know, kind of getting into along the lines of the way they'd say, the Jailer just pops up and doesn't work. I mean, the Jailer was obviously foreshadowed in BFA, but uh, yeah, look, that kind of thing was talked about. Uh, Mike brought up Emmett Selk. Good man. <laughs> Uh, basically, the word is that they want to craft a multi-expansion arc. They want things to be a bit less self-contained. Um, you know, less like having Khadgar appear for a bit and then just disappear for years, you know? Uh, basically, a downside of the very self-contained expansions is the amount of, you know, and then storytelling that ends up happening. I think it's a situation where, you know, there's the core plot points that literally have to happen to make the patches flow, right? Um, you know, content-wise. But when you're not planning like a, a long narrative and you're just kind of doing like these weird like little narrative sprints and then all the usual casualties of a game development pipeline happen, I think that's why we end up with this horrible threadbare plotline and we have situations like the whole, take the whole, um, you know, the idea of a self-contained expansion. 
At the start of Legion, they had a completely different plan for Sylvanas as to what they ended up having now in Shadowlands. And that resulted in a situation where Christy Golden then had to go and write an entire book to finally set the words straight in Sylvanas. Like, this is all just sloppy bullshit and, uh... I mean, is this kind of admission that they want to plan their story a bit more? Um, they want things to be more cohesive? I mean, honestly, there is basically little that would make me happier than them actually succeeding in this front. So uh, seeing that they're going to be applying a different direction moving forward, I think that really is fantastic news. I think this will help us get more consistent lore, less random twists and turns that don't really make sense. Overall, should be good. Then also, player housing. Basically, no time soon. The engine does not support it. I mean, right now. This thing with an engine, what, what is an engine? It's not a monolithic thing that doesn't change. Uh, they absolutely can do uh, player housing, and it would be, uh, overall, I would say, easy enough for them to do it as a company. But to do it fast, no. And also, it would be easy to do it, but as in, you can just get engineers and apply them on the problem, but then a thing comes up, it's a real bitch, called opportunity cost. Because all the time that those engineers could be building the player housing system, oh, they could also be making a dozen other things for the game, right? So, yeah, that overall means that when you combine opportunity cost with it not being supported by the engine right now, even though it is a very doable thing, it ends up being a hard-to-do thing. Because, uh, I mean, seriously, opportunity cost, you gotta learn that. Like, everyone... Opportunity cost is one of the the most important things that you can think about, even when it comes to allocating your own time. Because taking any opportunity, doing literally anything, incurs the cost. So people should understand opportunity cost. It is the thing that basically kills almost all of the nice-to-haves that we may think about in a game. So that's basically that. It would be a large project for their team to do. I completely believe that is a doable project. However, the cost of doing that project could be other things, and the sum total of that is that it's hard. <laughs> I know this stuff can be a bit confusing and weird to talk about, but uh, you, you gotta understand, like, this is a team of, like, 750 people. Can you imagine organizing that number of people across all of the different features and then doing the appropriate risk management? Because not only if you set a bunch of engineers onto player housing are you incurring the opportunity cost of them doing that instead of doing something else, uh, but also if it is a uh, more completely unsupported by the engine currently thing, then that does mean that there are more unknowns. Now that is a big problem if that player housing ends up being a dependency of a future patch or expansion, which does mean that if you want to do player housing, you probably have to start that like engineering effort like in two expand, you know, two expansions before you actually need to do it. Because if you commit to doing that feature, you really need to have a lot of risk killed off already. There you go. Development. It's it's a bastard and it's a miracle that any video games even come out in the first place. So yeah, this is basically stuff we've uh, already known, but like, kind of getting the texture around it. Honestly, I think we could get player housing in like two expansions time, but it's the sort of thing that is firmly not right now. It basically comes down, I think, to the level of sort of dynamicism that uh, they're able to do in the engine, and I know that, that is, you know, dynamic, that's a word that's up there with clunky in terms of, you know, high emotive value, low informational value. <laughs> uh, but basically, if they were to do player housing, it would just be them kind of reusing garrison tech, which isn't really player housing customization, it's just choose between a few preset options. Uh, it would be very, very, very different if they wanted to create a full, you know, player housing feature. But overall, look, it was good shit from the sort of little preview and taste that we got from Mike, and I am very excited to, uh, to see when his full interviews get launched, and absolutely, you know, good stuff on him. And, like, I mean, definitely good stuff on him, because to fly... Uh, you know, him and I don't know how many people on his team, uh, you know, went over to America, but that is, like, that's a lot of change. It's a lot of change. It is expensive to do that. And uh, again, I talked about opportunity costs later. Well, for every day that Mike is not in his office, you know, pumping out content, he's losing money. So, you know, not only does he have to pay the cost of going there, he also has to pay the opportunity cost of the lost revenue for taking up uh, that opportunity. And, uh, 
yeah, you know, it's the sort of thing he did not need to do for business reasons. And uh, I, I don't think he's doing it because he does actually care about shit, which, uh, yeah, I mean, shouldn't be a surprise. A lot of people, for some reason, have this like insane opinion on him, which is completely not grounded in reality. I can tell you from, you know, in-person experience, he's one of the most genuine and reasonable people uh, that, uh, that you will find. So... There you go. Can't wait to see those interviews come out. And overall, that is it for the World of Warcraft news today. Yeah, Dragonflight. We're almost there. Right now, me and the team are kind of setting, you know, settling in for the long haul. Uh, we're, we've planned out the entire month of content. So me and Matt, we've split up. We're searching for clues. Uh, he's taking class content. I'm doing a lot of UI and that kind of thing. Uh, of course, over on our editing team, we've got Nikki and Lace, who are handling the new lore series just being written by Jared. And uh, then, you know, me and Matt will be coordinating with John to get all the other videos done. So it's a whole big thing with many moving parts, but we got it all planned. And uh, honestly, man, that we now have an expansion that is actually looking on the up. It's like rekindled a lot of my uh, intrinsic ability to like, just to give a shit and have that like fire. I remember back in the days of Legion, like the amount of time I would just spend fiddling around with weak ores trying to make a cool UI purely because I cared about WoW and I found tinkering fun. And honestly, all of those like little fires have just re reawakened within my gaming soul, which is a very hammy way of putting it, but hey, that's that. Anyway, that's it for today's video. Let me know what your grand plans are for this expansion and what you think about things uh, as it stands. If you would like to support the team that is building all this content for you, you can check out the Patreon link down below. With that said, thank you for tuning in today. So much content coming. I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you next time.